any school officials. Miss Derek? She was going to be here. I don't see her. Okay, uh, at this time we'd like to welcome everyone to the Broadmoor Neighborhood Association Sheriff's Forum. At this time I'd like to introduce uh, both candidates and y'all look please. Mr. Hatfield uh, is running as the challenger and Sheriff Crater is running as the incumbent. Gentlemen, if y'all would shake hands. Thank you. <laughs> Both candidates agreed that this is a, would send a message to the audience, and I am so happy that they sent that message. Um, if everybody would please stand, we'd like to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly before the forum starts, we have a couple of announcements um, that we've been asked to share with y'all. Uh, first, from Senator Peacock, uh, we want, as a neighborhood association, for to encourage everybody to voice your support for the full completion of I-49, and we would hope that our candidates here tonight would also uh, endorse and work toward the completion of that. Our voices in this community need to be heard rather than the few people that are blocking this effort that we're going through right now. So, Senator Peacock, do you have anything you'd like to say very briefly? Just, I know there will be some forms that will come up uh, probably in December or January. It's important to take the time out of your schedule to go to those meetings and voice your support for I-29. You gather up those questions and make your comments. Thank you, sir. Also, um, uh, it was passed on to me that uh, Moody's Investor Service, unfortunately, has downgraded Shreveport's $228 million uh, in general obligation bonds from A1 to A2. You know, uh, if you come to the Broadmoor Neighborhood Association forums, you know we track these uh, figures and uh, we do everything we can to try to make sure that, that we get the highest bond ratings uh, possible because we are, you know, people who pay the taxes and we, we pay for these bonds, okay? So, with that said, uh, now it's time for the, the main item on our agenda, and that's the format that the shares for. I want to make sure and let everyone in this audience know that um, we, we contacted both candidates um, and talked to them about this form. Both candidates said they want a very civil, structured, formatted form, and that's what we're going to have here. Uh, there will be no questions from the audience. Questions were submitted in advance, and um, our board of directors of the Broadway Neighborhood Association met with our moderator, who, by the way, is Chris Redford. Um, and uh, we chose the questions that we would be asking. So I would uh, ask everyone in our audience to please respect th this format. We are guests of this church, who, and we've had this relationship with them for a long, long time, and we'd like to keep that. Uh, with that said, I don't see anything happening. Now, if anybody has a question of the candidates that they want to ask uh, personally, you may do so at the end of the forum. Both of these candidates will stay around and, I'm sure, answer any questions you might have individually. Okay, so um, we have... Um, the format's real simple. Uh, each candidate will give a two-minute introduction about themselves. Uh, then we will, uh, Mr. Refford will ask a series of 18 questions. The candidates have drawn to see who goes first. And to start the forum, Mr. Hatfield was uh, selected and he will be the candidate that uh, gives the first uh, opening. And then for the first eight questions, he will also be the candidate that answers the question first. At question nine, we will switch, and Sheriff Prater will answer the questions first. And he will also give his closing remarks first. Okay? And um, we ask that both candidates keep their answers 
uh, to the questions asked. And we've asked that our moderator facilitate that. So um, at this time, I'd like to turn our meeting over to Mr. Redford. I'd like you to give him a round of applause for the Good evening. I'm Cattle Harris Constable Eric Hatfield. I'm a lifelong resident of Shreveport. I lived in Broadmoor up until about 11 or 12 years ago. I currently own a home in Broadmoor now, and I'm a member of the Broadmoor Homeowner Association. I was a uh, Deputy Constable uh, 11 or 12 years ago, and started being a Deputy Constable. And I was elected my first term as Cattle Parish Constable in Ward 8. I served six years, and then I ran again unopposed as your Constable in Ward 8. And, it kind of meanders along this area right here. I, I've loved being a constable, it's been a great job and I'm, just, I'm completely happy with it. I just think that running for the office of sheriff, I can make uh, more changes throughout the parish rather than being specific to any one particular ward. I really appreciate the Broadmoor Homeowner Association for having us here now and giving us this opportunity to speak and answer questions and I'll be available after the uh, meeting also to answer any questions you may have if you're on your way answer them for. So again, I thank you for coming. I'm Constable Eric Hatfield. I encourage you to vote on October 24th, and I appreciate your vote. My name is Sheriff Steve Prater, and I've been the sheriff now for 15 years. Many of you may have followed my career before that, which was law enforcement. That's all I've ever known as a career. And that's what I think God wanted me to do. I was called to do that. The fact that I was called to do it's apparent in the results that we had at the Kettle Prairie Sheriff's Office for the last 15 years. I don't like to talk about myself. I never have. My close friends and most of the people in Kettle Parish know that. I like to talk about the brave men and women of the Kettle Parish Sheriff's Office that follow my leadership. They're the ones that get it done. They're the ones that do the things that you see the results uh, which is crime being down for the last 15 years. 41% far exceeds the national average. You see our money. I'm very proud of the way that we handle our tax money that you citizens are good enough to give us. Of course, I always like to tell everyone that the Federal Prairie Sheriff's Office collects your taxes, but we only keep 9%, which is an important thing to stress. With that 9%, we work very hard at doing what you would want us to do. We don't go to Washington Mardi Gras. We don't take flights all around the United States. We bring the training that is so necessary for Cattle Parish, for law enforcement, for the Shreveport Police Department, for the Marshal's Office, for everyone in law enforcement. We bring the training here to save money so we can have more people trained. And so we do an excellent job of taking care of your money. You notice I say we. And so what I'm asking you for on October the 24th, I'm asking you to renew my contract. I can't imagine you not, because you've seen the results that you've asked for, and I produced them because of my team. And when I say team, I don't mean the few people that work around me. I'm talking to the almost 1,000 people that are paid by the Cattle Prairie Sheriff's Office. And so if you want to keep the quality of service that you've had, which is something I'm extremely proud of, and you vote for Steve Prater to be your sheriff. Thank you. previously, about three years ago, he got a bill passed where the debt constables 
could have as many depths as you wanted, so we appreciate you doing that. And since then, those depths have been taken away, and now we have one depth each. Um, what do they do and what type of police powers do they have? They have the same. The constable, the constable's deputy constables have the exact same police powers as a cattle parish sheriff deputy or a cattle parish sheriff. They patrol your neighborhoods in Aaron Ward 8. We do theft, we do drug, drug arrest, we do uh, uh, security for individuals that ask, and things of that nature. Basically the same things as any other deputy. Sheriff Frederick, how many people are currently employed by the Sheriff's Office? How do you choose deputies? Media constantly reports on city police being suspended. There is rarely any reports of deputies being suspended. What's the secret? Finally, what is the difference between a Sheriff's deputy and a city police officer? <laughs> Two minutes, okay. We have roughly a thousand people that are associated with the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office. Everyone there has so much pride in the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, they like to be called deputies. In fact, not all of them have arrest power. There are many in administrative functions. The ones that have arrest power are those that are fully trained and have post-certified and been through all of the necessary training in order to, to uh, earn the citizens trust enough to have arrest power, which is something, a very solemn thing. It's a very serious thing in the Kettle Bear Sheriff's Office to have arrest power. Uh, there is a lot of difference between the city police and the Kettle Bear Sheriff's Office as far as the function goes. They both have authority, both have arrest ability, they both have a lot of training, but the Shreveport Police Department is reserved, their, their, their uh, jurisdiction is within the area of the Shreveport Police Department. The Kettle Bear Sheriff's Office has the entire parish where we have that authority, where we can police. Many of the Shreveport police officers uh, have sworn in because we do a lot of task, for, task forces. Uh, that's where we can eliminate duplication of services and we can get Shreveport Police Department, the ones that are on narcotics, the ones that do some of their fugitive recovery, some of the ones that do the things out in the parish, we swear them in, providing they have the proper training, and they therefore can police in the entire parish, helping all the citizens of Cattle Parish, not just Shreveport, but Cattle also, because we look at it as one parish. Even though Shreveport is a portion of that parish, the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office serves all of the parish, including the citizens of Shreveport. Constable Hatfield. Law enforcement through the nation is under scrutiny, and it seems that every community is a powder keg waiting to explode. What will you do as the chief law enforcement officer of this parish to be proactive in developing a civil atmosphere where all citizens feel that law enforcement is fair? One, I do that by being a sheriff that gets along and works well and close with every single other agency involved in law enforcement cattle parish. I'll be the sheriff that will work with the DA, no matter regardless who who wins the DA's race, I'll work with our work that is returning. I'll work with the police chief, I'll work with the city marshal, I'll work with the DEA, the ATF, FBI, all other agencies. It's very important we work together in unison so that we can ensure the safety and, the sit and then make sure that we're providing the best law enforcement that we can to the citizens around us. Sheriff Prater, same question? You bet. Law enforcement through the nation is under scrutiny and it seems that every community is a powder keg waiting to explode. What will you do as the chief law enforcement officer of this parish to be proactive in developing a civil atmosphere where all citizens feel that law enforcement is fair? I can't speak for the entire nation. I can speak for Kettle Parish. Kettle Parish is not a powder keg. Kettle Parish is very proud and, and responds to things like uh, Appreciating the Shreveport Police Department, the Marshal Service, and the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office with festivals, with prayer vigils, with appreciation banquets. And so we are not a powder keg in the Cattle Parish area. I know we have to be aware of things that happen nationally. We have to constantly be aware of what we do in the field of police work because it affects all sorts of persons. And you have to remember everybody comes from a diverse background having been treated differently. But Cattle Parish is not a powder keg. I'm proud of the responsiveness and the openness and the community programs and community attitude that the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, which keeps it from being a powder keg. Thank you. Constable Hatfield. In the wake of the Ferguson riots in 2014, a Republican presidential candidate wrote an op-ed in a nationally syndicated magazine concerning the militarization of law enforcement in America. 
In that article, the Bossier Sheriff's Office was referenced as having a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on an armored vehicle. Do we have any equipment like that, and what purpose would such a weapon serve our law enforcement? Now, I can't speak to the Bossier Sheriff's, Sheriff's Office, so I'm not sure what they have or what they don't have. And as far as do we have a need for that, then I, I don't see a need for a 50 caliber weapon, but if maybe if the Sheriff's Office in Bossier Parish saw a need for it, then that was, that, that was his decision and his discretion. Don't appreciate the question with one of the few words I can't pronounce. Military. You hear about militarization of police departments. The uh, it was it was in the I think the Shreveport Times was talking about the fact that how many how many AR-15s that we had at the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office that came from the military. Yes, we have quite a few of them. Yes, our patrol deputies have to qualify, I believe, six times a year and they have to shoot at 90 percent. They have to be secured in their vehicles because they answer calls many, many times out by themselves. But these are the same weapons that the military donated to us that we would have had to go on to Barney's or to Tico Supply and purchase the exact same weapons except different serial numbers. So we save the Cattle Parish uh, citizens of Cattle Parish many thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars by taking things from the military. We have a really nice personnel carrier that we pay $2,400 for. It would have cost $240,000 had we bought it. We've refurbished it. We use it all the time. If an officer's down, if a citizen's down, and there's gunfire around, we can go in and get that person out. We can go on high-risk warrants, and it's used quite often on high-risk warrants if we need to go crash in a door or to go somewhere like that to where we don't want to get our officers and deputies shot up. So that's a, that's kind of a touchy subject with me, but I'm I'm kind of a feely touchy kind of guy. And so this is a extremely uh, this is this is an area that is much misreported in the media. The truth is it saves money and besides if there is someone at at uh, Arthur Circle or somebody at one of the schools around here, and they have an AR-15, and they're shooting your kids up. That's time. Do you do you think you want somebody showing up with less than that? The cattle commission is currently considering a bill to limit where cattle residents can shoot. Do you support that? What is the current law? And will you allocate funds from your department to create more safe and affordable shooting ranges for residents to use in different parts of the parish? <laughs> cattle Parish Commission is considering a bill to limit where cattle residents can shoot. Do you support that? What is the current law? And will you allocate funds from your department to create more safe and affordable shooting ranges for residents to use in different parts of the parish? One, I support the Second Amendment, and I do believe that every citizen has the right to bear arms. Two, I do support the shooting ranges, and, and if the parish has the funds to do so, then I do think the parish should allow, provide places for these residents to shoot. And then three, as far as, like, I do know a little bit about the new Cattle Parish Commission uh, law that they're trying to pass that says that you can't uh, discharge a firearm within a thousand feet of a uh, designated subdivision. And I think that they're trying, to, if I've read it correctly or heard it correctly, I think that they're trying to make it to where incorporate a lot of those other subdivisions in the rural areas of the parish where they have problems with varmints and coyotes and things of that nature. And so I do believe that those people should have the right to protect their homes, whether it be less than a thousand feet or more than a thousand feet. I think that these citizens do that they're protected by the Second Amendment for the right to bear arms to protect their family. And if they're protecting their family or their home, and using and you, it takes a firearm to do it, and I think they should have every right to do so. Chef Prager. There's a controversy with the Cattle Parish Commission and the state legislature, and I say controversy is a little bit of a disagreement with some commissioners and some legislators, possibly. Prior to this last uh, legislative session in Baton Rouge, the law was very strict and that our that a, a application of that law would have prevented anybody from the parish from almost anyone from shooting a firearm. 
the state law was changed whereby it gave the ability of anything with five acres or less is had to do with it was whatever the commission decided if it had more than five acres and the commission couldn't tell you what to do with your large parcel of land now the commission wants to come back and they want to checkmate that particular law i tell you all this to tell you it's very controversial it depends on where you live but I also want to tell you there's already a law that says you cannot discharge a firearm if there's foreseeable, uh, if it's foreseeable that an injury or damage might occur. So there's already a current law. And so what we try to do with the sheriff's office, and when there's something like this, is one of these hot-blooded issues that is so controversial, you just tell me what the law is and we're going to enforce it because it's not up to the sheriff to decide whether you should shoot a firearm at a coyote or a deer. It's up to the sheriff to enforce whatever the legislative branches choose to apply. And that's what we're waiting on the commission to pass whatever they're going to. Then we'll wait for the court to determine exactly how that's to be applied as far as constitutionality. And then you tell us what to what the law is, we're going to apply it. Thank you. are complaining that it is difficult. Okay. Citizens are complaining that it is difficult for their kids to fulfill the hunter safety course requirement to get hunting licenses. Will you offer that course at least once a year in an after school program or during the summer at every high school? Absolutely, I do support hunter safety courses. I do support any training that we can offer our youth and kids of the parish where they can get out and, and learn hunter safety so they can enjoy the sport. Sheriff Herder? Certainly, we, uh, we're very much pro hunter with the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, and of course, we taught that course for quite some time, some of the deputies did. But it got to be so time consuming, it is a state function. It is a state function and requirement that you have to do that. If we begin to do everything that the state requires, then sure enough and soon enough, we won't be able to serve the citizens of Cattle Bears. Let the state come in and make it more accessible, which they have done. You can take it online, uh, the bulk of it, and then you can get with uh, Department of Wildlife Fisheries or a private. A uh, particular private person or private entity that is qualified to do this and you can take it and, and get it done But we can't continue to do things. We have opened our range up for hunters to uh, To sight in their rifles and done some things that other sheriff's officers have now made around the area Which I guess that's the best form of flattery. We see it a lot uh, People mimicking what we do at the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office And this is one of the very reasons and one of the things that you might have seen with the hunter safety course What are your thoughts on body cameras? We all can see the need for them, but there are examples of times when they're not appropriate. I think that now in light of, and this kind of goes back to the Ferguson issue also, that in light of the Ferguson issue, obviously if there were body cams and there may have uh, dispelled a lot of controversy that occurred as a result of those events. Uh, it's, it's a departmental issue that's up to the department, I think, as the Sheriff's Office chooses to do it, that maybe another agency somewhere else may not do it. It all depends on the need and what the, the sheriff at that time feels like there's a need for. I do think that there are cases to where a body cam would, would tell the true story, tell the full story, and uh, make it easier for law enforcement to act. And there's also times when it may or might not be necessary. I think when the officers are riding in the car or when they're doing other things besides being on that call, then they shouldn't be wearing cameras. But I think that when they're interacting with the public versus a hostile situation, domestic violence or something like that, I do think body cameras are necessary. And that's for officer safety as well as the individual's protection that they're serving. Yes, I believe in body cameras. I think that, yeah, I'd like to see every deputy that we have, and they would like to be wearing a body camera not just for a hot cause like domestic violence, but it would be necessary to be on every citizen interaction. 
Because you never know in law enforcement when something's going to turn nasty quick. And you don't have time, you've got enough to do besides turning and finding, oh, I should have had my body camera on. But more important than body cameras, I think it's necessary, before you mandate that we wear body cameras, mandate training. What about that? Because you could put a body camera, go to the zoo and put a body camera on a monkey, and I'll tell you what it's going to show. But you put a body camera on somebody that's trained, and chances are good you're going to see a good response. But you put a body camera on somebody that's not, and you're going to see a nasty response. And you talk about a bad Ferguson, and that's what you're going to have. So the body cameras, it's, they're very expensive. And here again, we've got to find ways. We either got to cut something or find new revenue, because there's not a lot of money just sitting around saying, I want to be spent on body cameras. And has anybody ever explained to anyone, not only the cost of body cameras, but the memory storage, extremely expensive, extremely expensive. We were the first at the County Fair Sheriff's Office, we were one of the first in this whole area to have full uh, cameras in your cars. We were the first there. When I was with the Shreveport Police Department, I mandated that the cameras be in the cars and that the kind that no one can, the, the deputy or the officer cannot fool with, cannot erase, cannot download themselves. They drive by the station, they park, and it's downloaded automatically. So that's the kind of thing that so many people don't understand. You can take body camera real quick, it doesn't mean much to anybody. You say body camera to a professional law enforcement person, it's expensive and a lot of work. Closer. How important is transparency in the office to you? Do you think an elected official should be held accountable to the same standards as every other citizen? That's a fantastic question. And yes, I, I think the transparency is very important. I think that each and every candidate that each and every candidate should be held to the same standards. I think the sheriff should be held to the same standards as every, every single citizen in which he serves and the citizens that put that person in office. And as far as transparency, there's, uh, you know, as far as it goes back to before you were an officer or while you're during, during the time that you're an officer, the citizens need to know who you are. If you require the citizens to have their past open up, then I think that the sheriff should also have their past open up also. Could you not want full transparency? Of course I believe in it. Thank you. Okay, we are at question number nine. Sheriff Prater will lead. An investigation's primary purpose is to ascertain if a law has been broken where a person is accused of a crime. With all the accusations flying around about the Cato Commission, is it appropriate for the Sheriff's Office to launch such an investigation? Will you do so if you win this election? Yes, sir, and without being completely transparent, because there are times when you shouldn't be in the reaching and talking about uh, investigations. Certainly, if the Cato Barriers Commission has done something illegal and proper, that would fall under the statutes, that would meet something that the Cattle Fair Sheriff's Office could take to a prosecutor. That's the key. That's the key. All right, without going into detail, many, many, many times corruption is taken to a prosecutor and nothing's done with it. We are turned down, but I can't go out there because it's been turned down, the prosecution's been turned down. People recuse themselves from certain crimes that, that really need to be prosecuted. We have no control over that. We're just one of three legs. One is law enforcement. We investigate things, and I promise you, the Kettle Bear Sheriff's Office, we get criticized because we'll go after everybody, including our enemies. You ever heard that? We go after anybody. I'll tell you what, we go after anybody we suspect of violating the law, put the case together, take it to the prosecutor. Prosecutor. And if they'll take it either federal or local, and if they won't take one, we'll take it to the other, which is the case of the current commissioner that is under indictment because of our case. 
right? So, of course, we do investigate anybody in Caddo Parish from my deceased mother to the Caddo Parish Commission. I don't care who it is. We're going to look at it if we think they violated the law. I'm not so sure that I'd be interested in going after my deceased mother. And my mother's not deceased, she's here, and I'm grateful for that. But as far as an elected official, I do have an opinion on this. As far as an elected official investigating another elected official, as far as any commissioner anywhere, I think that that's a, uh, that's a bit of a problem. I think if one, one elected official shouldn't have a political corruption team that goes after other elected officials, I think that if it's an elected official, then it should be handed off to a state agency, the state police, or the attorney general's office. And that's just, that's my position on that. Sheriff Herder. The sheriff's office has the responsibility of collecting property taxes. How many delinquent taxpayers are there in Caddo? And what approach will your office take to see that those responsible pay those back taxes? Okay, we collect about 225,000 pieces, parcels of property. I don't know how many people own each one because that would be, if, if I understood your question right, but I know how many parcels of property that we collect from. And we, we were one of the first in the state to come up with a creative way after the law was changed whereby people that don't pay their property taxes they're the ones that have to pay for the collection of those property taxes. It's a, a business called Archon, and they have a business in New Orleans, and their job, if they, people don't pay there, because there's some people that just historically will not pay their property taxes, time after time after time. We got tired of them not paying them. And so we've got this company that comes in, and that person, the scoff law, is that what you call them? You don't pay the tax? That person then has to pay the taxes, and then they have to pay the collection of those taxes. They have to pay that cost in addition. It doesn't come from your taxpayers, that, those of us that pay our taxes on time. It comes from those that don't pay our taxes on time. They then have to pay the company in New Orleans. We pay them nothing out of your money if you pay your taxes. They're paid for by people that don't pay their taxes. And they complain and gripe and moan and groan, but too bad. Most of us pay our taxes. That's what you're supposed to do, is pay your taxes and pay them on time. Thank you. Actually, I disagree with uh, the fact that the company in New Orleans collects your taxes. I, as a developer, I have several pieces of property. During a reassessment year, your taxes will go up, and then during a non-reassessment year, it's not a reassessment year, your taxes shouldn't go up. So I have several buildings in the industrial park, and each year I'll have two or three buildings that may have been $3,800 this year, and they may double the next year. So those thousands of us that are developers or real estate owners, then we go and we, we, uh, we contest these taxes and ask that they be reevaluated. So once we contest them and ask these taxes to be reevaluated, then they become late after, I don't know, after Martin, whatever the days they become late. Every single tax notice that comes after that point does not come from New Orleans. The Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office is paying a company out of California to collect your taxes. All of your length of taxes has come from a company in California. If elected as your sheriff, we will no longer use California or New Orleans to collect your length of property taxes or any other property taxes. We'll offer those jobs to the citizens of Cattle Parish, the people that are unemployed here, that are, that are able-bodied able -bodied and willing, and anyone that can make a phone call or stuff in an envelope that wants a job, we'll offer those jobs to Cattle Parish citizens and we'll take those jobs away from California. the need between officer safety and due process for citizens? Well, those are two different subjects that don't really relate. Of course, every interaction that we have with the Carroll Parish citizen, uh, due process is something that is, I mean, it's a polite contact, it's a cordial contact, unless it's not warranted as such. And how does that relate to the safety of the officers uh, uh, officers deputies is what we like to call them the deputies they they are constantly trained 
and constantly through in-service training, which is required each year, they're taught the newest and best ways of interviewing persons, of protecting yourself, of protecting your firearm, of less than lethal force if it gets into a situation like that. So there's a lot of things that go into that question. It, it cheats it to say two minutes. But due process is something that is more involved with the law as far as make sure that you have your rights that you go to court at a particular time and you're served correctly and you're appointed an attorney and all that. But citizen contacts, of course, we are extremely polite until it's not warranted. And then we're going to take care of business. And most of all, I want my deputies going home with their husbands or wives. And that's of foremost uh, importance to me. And just reflecting on another question, the, the tax information that you heard last is completely wrong, what you were just told. Not for me, thank you. Actually, I agree with almost every single thing that Sheriff Peter said until the very last bit. So I do agree that there is a, do, that there is a difference between due process and officer safety. I think due process is exactly the way you describe it. And then I think officer safety is uh, starts with the, your initial point of contact when you when you first contact that citizen. If you contact that citizen, you know, in a in a non-confrontational manner, then a lot of times you you'll be you'll that'll be reciprocated. But he's right. I mean, it, it's all about the officers going home at the end of the day for, for their wives, husbands, sons, daughters, and family, and that's what's most important. Sheriff Frater. Concealed weapons, your thoughts and what will you do to make these classes more available for citizens? The concealed weapon classes, we were the first sheriff's office that started offering them uh, many years ago. It became to be, it became such a drain on our manpower that we had to figure out a way, so we started to charge enough to where when my hired deputies back overtime, pay them overtime to do the courses. Now there's a lot of different groups out there and individuals that offer concealed weapon courses. I think concealed weapons, I'm very much a proponent of having a concealed weapon, provided you are, that you are trained with that. That's, that's the key. You'll hear me see her tra say training so many times. You can't take a course and all of a sudden put a pistol in your pocket and think that you're protected. You are more harm to society than you are help. It's not until you take that weapon until you are, are, are proficient with it, till you have been trained and practiced and trained and practiced and trained and practiced. So yes, I believe in the concept, but I have to put the caveat on there that you've got to have the training and the mindset to be able to use it to protect your family and yourself. If that's the case, then certainly I am much a proponent of concealed weapon training and courses because we started offering them. We were the first to offer them. Of course I'm for them. And actually, the, the, the state of Louisiana supports the concealed carry law. I support the concealed carry law. I think that uh, the state, and the state, I know the state mandates the requirements for concealed carry, and that I encourage it, and I support the Second Amendment. I think that we should all, like I said earlier, we should all have the right to bear arms, and that if, if the criminals on the street have guns, then we have to be able to protect ourselves equally. So I do support the training. I do support concealed weapons permits. I do, and I do support the fact that, that you need to be trained to carry it. Chair Prater, what do you see as the biggest issues facing law enforcement over the next four years? And what two things would you like to accomplish in that time frame? Well, here again, the biggest issues facing the Cattle Prairie Sheriff's Office are to continue on the path that we've had, and that is that the sheriff be the chief law enforcement officer of the parish and the ex officio tax collector. So that's at the very top. Anything that comes, nothing can take over the safety of the citizens. That's the number one issue uh, that the Cattle Prairie Sheriff's Office. But intertwined in that are things that we talked about tonight. Intertwined in it are such things as the way that we treat the public, the way that the public treats us, the transparency issue. People need to know what we're doing. We need to tell them what we're doing. We need to get closer and closer to the community every day, and the community needs also to get closer and closer to us. And what, that's what you're seeing. Instead of us being a powder keg, what you're seeing here is that these citizens are up in arms, just a, just a speech, uh, 
But they're up in arms wanting to applaud us and wanting to say thank you and wanting to do this. And that in turn has caused us to draw closer to them. So we're more of one body than we've ever been. And so that's one of the huge issues. It's not the safety of the citizens because that's paramount. But it's how the citizens are treated, how the citizens treat us, understanding us and the job that we do. There's so many misperceptions in, in law enforcement. People that kind of, they, they don't understand what we're doing and we think that they do. So we've got a, we've got a bigger job to educate the citizens of why we do what we do and what the laws actually are. And so if we'll continue along the path that we're on, our issues are solvable. That's what I feel. I mean, educating the citizens is one thing, but being the sheriff that, that supports and protects each and every citizen is more important. There's a, there's a great need for more patrol and, and, and any patrol in some of the north end of the parish. And so I've talked to many people and visited with citizens in the rural areas of the parish, and, and there's been, it's been said, I guess, in the last forum that the parish is 900 square miles. And that within that, if there's a car wreck or a major wreck in one end of the parish, then all the deputies may be tied up on that one end of the parish. I, I guess my question would be that is, if I was out of town working and one of my family members or my children were home alone in a rural end of the parish at a dead end road and they saw an armed gunman outside their house and they called 911, what are they going to say? If every single deputy is tied up on that call, then I think that we need to we need to reassess the situation, make sure that we have deputies available in all areas. I think one way to do that is to take some of the specialty divisions that, that house specialty like the safety town and things of that nature, and use these deputies to make sure that we have more control in the rural areas and make sure every single citizen in the parish has equal access to law enforcement at a parish. It's very important. That's what your tax dollars pay for and that's what you deserve. Also, I guess I've got to make but officer morale is very important. That's one of the key issues that we need. The officer, if the officers are happy, if they go home happy and they come to work happy, they pass that on to the citizens of federal parish. So it's very important to treat these deputies with respect and courtesy and compassion. Sheriff Herder, when it comes to public safety, one of the key elements is communication, especially in the event of a natural or man-made disaster. What are your thoughts and would you commit to the building a tornado proof facility for our local emergency 911 operations center? The 911 emergency operations center is put together by the 911, it's the 911 board. The 911 board is voted on and the money that goes to them is voted on by you citizens and taxpayers. If you choose to build a tornado-proof 911 center, that's great, but the Cattle Prairie Sheriff's Office is under no obligation, and we don't have the $100 million it would take to build one. Instead, this is what we've done. Instead, we have gone and made sure that we have contingency plans. As the Director of Homeland Security, that was one of the first things I did. If a tornado hits the 911 center, which is building, was built years and years ago and is not tornado-proof, but is very sound, if something does happen there, we have contingency plans where we automatically have arrangements to move to the port, which has a beautiful building down there that is tornado proof, and that's where our emergency operations and our communication center goes. So that's ready to go, costing you nothing. And so, yeah, it'd be great if somebody wants to come up with the money. We'll sure, we'll sure staff it, but instead, and in the meantime, we choose to save taxpayer money and make contingency plans in buildings that are already safe should something happen. And I, I agree completely with what the sheriff said, that the, there's obviously not enough funds available in the sheriff's office, nor will there be to do such a thing. I think we should use the funds that we have available to protect the citizens and serve the citizens. And if, and if we have a facility that's already available that can be used for that, then that's the perfect, that's the perfect option. But as far as funding, you, the taxpayers, decide that and not the sheriff. Sheriff Prater, describe two significant accomplishments in your law enforcement career that you consider to be the most significant points for voters to hear. Wow. 
Who's the... Well, I think the first thing, one of the things I'm most proud of, and I have to reflect back at the Shreveport Police Department when I was there. Uh, you may have heard of the Jump Out Boys, Directed Patrol. You may have heard of the gangs that were that we eliminated in the Bottoms, the Bottoms Boys. You may remember those efforts. Well, that a lot of that was my, I'd say my brainstorm, but a lot of it, the decentralization, making captains responsible for their areas, all that is something that I came up with as a plan. D.D. E. Stevens is here, and he was in charge of that effort. And, and also lend it to it and would he go into much more detail about the operational plans. But I know that if we, if somebody's selling dope on a street corner and they're not scared of a marked unit, then what you do is run unmarked units in on there. And then you run marked units in on there that would chase them. And then you go back to regular patrol. It's a, it's a simple concept, but it worked. And that's why the homicide rate went from 93 back then one year to like 17 when we're here. That's one of the prime reasons. So that's one of the things, aggressive law enforcement. The other thing is the many, many, many programs, not only at the Street Court Police Department, but at the Cattle Fair Sheriff's Office, programs that allow the citizens to what I call target harden. Okay, that makes it where you're less of a target. You're more apt to learn the things that will take care of yourself, like hiding your packages, lighting up your home, all of these things to where you're hardening yourself as a target. And the programs that have brought the community together to where we're not a power keg. We are so close to the community, and I know there's parts that we're not close to, as close as we should, but we're working towards it. Constable Hatfield. Well, my best, my number one accomplishment is being a father. As far as my accomplishments, as far as law enforcement, I'm, the sheriff has 43 years, I mean, he's almost 70 years old, and he has 43 years law enforcement experience, so it's hard to match that. When the Bottoms boys came around, I was a kid. So my greatest accomplishment would be the fact that, I, that I've served as a cattle person officer for Ward 8. I've done so to the best of my ability with little or no funding. I've patrolled the streets of cattle parish for almost 12 years, most of the time 30, 40 hours a week and I've kept the neighborhood safe, I've kept crimes down and within Ward 8, and if elected the sheriff, I'll do so with the entire parish. If not, I'll continue to do the same thing in Ward 8. Final question. Sheriff Prater, how do we reduce incarceration costs to the taxpayers? Let me see if I can get up here one more time. <laughs> that you can count tax money better than you can years because I ain't near 70. <laughs> anyway, I have created, one of the greatest things is when we created the Criminal Justice uh, Task Force. And it was when I brought the DA's office and the judges and probation parole and the city police and the county parish sheriff's office together in one room. And there was, there was actually, I had some media attention about this. We reduced the numbers of people that were in CCC, awaiting trial, we reduced that by several hundred. And it's lasted for about four years now. So I'm extremely proud of that. I'm extremely proud of the, of the different programs we started, like the reentry program. We were the first in the state to do that because we don't want to see them again. We have very few, relatively speaking, very few state prisoners. We have no state prisoners that we hold out there just for money. We have state prisoners because you can cause them, you can force them to work because they're felons. We have about 800 out there that are awaiting trial. Some as much as seven years awaiting trial. You can't force them to work. And so I've done all I can do as sheriff, plus some, plus some, plus some, to save you citizens of Cattle Parish a lot of money, a lot of money through the Criminal Justice Task Force. And that was a concept that the Sheriff's Office brought. We forced the DA's office into it, and the judges bought into it because the DA's are the ones, they're the ones controlling the calendar in the courtroom. Constable Hatfield. I'm sure, Sheriff. I'm elected to Sheriff. I will not force the DA's office into anything. One, one way to decrease the number of people locked up or to reduce incarceration. Last time I checked, there was 1,200, there were 1,273 inmates in the Cattle Parish Jail. 
1,273 is far over the capacity of the Cattle Parish Jail. First, we need to have more officers on the street rather than arresting people for, for, for small misdemeanor crimes as far as if you've got a, if we only have two deputies on the north end of the parish, say we have two deputies in Bibby, two deputies are out there and they stop a, they stop a gentleman and he has a dime bag of weed or he has a, he has a <clears throat> marijuana roach or something like that. If, you, if he has no, no previous history of crimes, he's never been arrested before, it's going to take that officer up to two hours to, to, book, to arrest that individual, take him to CCC, book him in, and then return back patrol. While this officer is, in, is, is driving all the way to CCC and doing this, someone's home be broken into, someone could be raped, murdered, shot, something bad could happen. I think we need to stick to it. As long as we have a shortage of officers on patrol, we need to stick to be smart on real on real crime and some of these things that 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 you can let go, let go if, it's, if it means if, if it's in the matter of public safety. Okay, each candidate gets two minutes closing, starting with Sheriff Prater. Okay, uh, just one point of fact: the current capacity of CCC is fifteen hundred which is more than 1273. Uh, so I just thought I'd let you know that we're not over capacity, we're 250 below capacity. Anyway, just thought I'd straighten that out. But in closing, I'm gonna tell you something. I talked to you about the Kettle Parish Sheriff's Office because that's easy for me to say, but I wanna tell you something about Steve Prater. Steve Prater is a man to begin with, okay? And I don't mean that as a sexist statement. I mean that, that everybody reaches their point. Okay? A point of whereby they're tired of, 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 they just get tired of things being said that are not true. Amen. And I've reached that point. And so anyway, that's all I'll say about that because we've done nothing but high road and that's what we're going to do. I'm so proud of, I'm so proud of the Kevin Perry Sheriff's Office and I'm proud of Steve Prater. I'm proud of the fact that God gave me an ability to lead folks. And it takes a lot for me to even say that because I'm a humble person. And anybody that knows me knows that's just not a joke. That's a true statement. But I'm proud of the fact that I have been open to God's calling to go into law enforcement and to lead brave men and women like I've been so fortunate to lead. They don't need, they don't need anybody to tell them what to do except somebody to set that point on the horizon. And I said, men, women, that's where we need to go. And that's the sheriff's office that you see is one that's over there at that point and constantly going to it. And that's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of my leadership skills that my father put inside me that God called me for. And that's what I'm proud of. So that's my two minutes for all I'm going to take talking about Steve Freight. But the Cattle Prairie Sheriff's Office is a fine, fine organization that is results-oriented. And you can't argue that. You can argue a lot of things. You misrepresent numbers. But you can't argue the fact that we've got results. And that's because of the brave men and women in this room. Thank you. Sheriff, it will not be about Eric Hatfield. It's going to be about the citizens and taxpayers of Cattle Parish. I will do my very best to serve each and every one of you to the best of my ability. I'll have an open door policy where you where you can call me, you can you can meet with me, and if there's something that you've tried to get resolved with, with another office within the department and you can't get it resolved, then you can come to me. I'll be your sheriff, a sheriff for the people, for every single person in Cattle Parish, regardless of your color or your income. I'll be there for every single one of you, and I will do my very best. I'll make mistakes. I won't be the greatest, parent, the greatest sheriff that's ever been in this parish, but I will do my very best to serve you and be a public servant rather than being self-serving. I'm Eric Hatcher, and I really appreciate your vote on October 24th. Okay, next the form. Each um, Sheriff, Hack, or Sheriff um, Prager and Constable Hackman will stick around if you have any individual questions. We appreciate you guys coming. Uh, once, one thing before y'all leave, every one of y'all, uh, or every other chair,